It's sunny and warm, and the locals are sipping tea next to a modern Art Deco building shaped like an airplane. Miami Beach? No. A train from the 1930s chugs from the sea to the capital, 2,400 meters high through stunning mountain beauty. Switzerland? Wrong. A small country that won its existence by defeating a nation 20 times its size. A proud, stubborn group of warriors who act like winners. A land half Muslim and half Christian, where religious conflict is no part of the national psyche. You find a mosque here and a church here, one goes to his mosque, one goes to his and nothing happened. Where could it be? Africa, that's where. Eritrea, to be specific. In the 1930s, Mussolini tried to turn Eritrea's capital, Asmara, into an African Rome. They called it Piccola Roma, which is Little Rome. And adorned it with playful, modern architecture. Asmara, for me, is, is almost like an urban utopia. It's serving as a symbol of, of uh, Eritrean know-how, you know, that we inherited over the years. From Asmara to the Red Sea, a ride on the train reveals a stunning landscape of geography and people. Eritrea has uh, nine ethnic groups and nine languages. We are not uh, like the other Africans. We are Semitic, so we have a lot of Arabic, Hebrew, and the Christianity. Nomads in some of the hottest desert on earth. It's very hot in this area. Therefore, they migrate to the place where they can find water. Others in isolated mountaintop villages. It takes nearly four and five hours to drive to the village. Christian and Muslim. Side by side. in a land where man first developed. It goes back to the Ark of Covenant, you know, with the Queen of Sheba, Solomon, the Old Testament. A land of both the ancient and the modern. It maintained both the modern and at the same time, the permanent value of the society. Five and a half million people of different faiths, different ethnic groups, from vastly different geographies throughout the history of this country. No major, no inbred, inborn, major fights have been seen between the regions and the religions. What holds them together? It is their nationhood. You can speak a different language and live in one part of the country and another one can live in another part of the country, but they can count their ancestry back to the same, to the same ancestor. I think our history has been a history of struggle. It took us a long time to, to free our country. A people who built schools and hospitals in the trenches and we were hiding the enemy lines. We were printing our books. A pharmaceutical factory was, was established out there. Rise to nationhood. But after a long uh, bloody struggle, we got in our independence in 91. 
Now, we are independent country. Now, a land of fighters is fighting for its survival under a military standoff with Ethiopia. This is a no war, no peace situation that, that can tip either way. They won last time. But if there's a next time, will Eritrea survive as a nation? Every Sunday night in this city, many of the townspeople take to a broad avenue and go for a walk. They walk in a beautiful climate, past striking buildings, past churches and mosques. They are walking through a city that was once a radical experiment in utopian architecture and fascism and is today unique in all the world. The locals call the walk the Pasajero. It is pleasant and calm. And everything that is pleasant about the Pasajero could be gone tomorrow. These people live in a city called Asmara, capital of a country called Eritrea, a nation that stands on the brink between war and peace. It could go either way. Each Pasajero could be its last. But then, Eritreans are used to fighting the odds. Eritrea sits on a strategic choke point in the corner of the Horn of Africa. It guards the route from the Middle East to Africa and access to the Mediterranean. It's always been an attractive spot for trade and invasion. Many people and cultures have passed through this land down the millennia. Each left something that stuck. This is a crossroads. And, uh, People coming for, through the sea, from the sea, from across the, uh, the Red Sea, people coming from across the western borders, from Sudan, people coming from what is present day Ethiopia, and so on. In the south you find the, the similarities between the peoples of Eritrea and what is present day Ethiopia, the similarities between uh, the Sudanese and, and the Eritreans, and the simil similarities between the Arabs and, uh, and, and the Eritreans from, from this side. So, it's always been a very uh, interesting blend of uh, cultures and uh, ethnic origins. This is the story of Eritrea, a little nation that would be adorned by the Axis, annexed by its neighbor, and would fight an extraordinary 30-year war for independence, and, against all odds, win. As a nation, it would prove innovative in health and education, and struggle to preserve its culture. But Eritrea as we know it began when an Italian company bought a swath of land from a local sultan near Misawa on the Red Sea coast. The Italian government bought up more and more land and on January 1st, 1890, Italy's King Umberto I declared Eritrea a colony of Italy. Its capital, Masawa. Masawa has long been an important port for goods from around the world. It is steeped in Islamic history as its architecture reveals. And it is hot and humid. An American visitor once wrote, Masawa combined in one spot, the highest temperatures and the highest humidities known anywhere. 
The next stop beyond Misawa was Hades. But not for the Italians. For them, the next spot would be a climate more Roman and hospitable, 50 kilometers west and two and a half kilometers higher in altitude. A highland village called Asmara. It was actually four villages connected by a road and a church. But Asmara would forever be changed by events taking place back in Rome. In 1921, Benito Mussolini and the Fascist Party seized power in Italy. Mussolini only thought big. For him, that meant nothing less than a return to the days of the Roman Empire. He would start that empire in Africa, and he would build its new Rome in Asmara. The buildup was on. Throughout the 1920s and 30s, Italians flocked to Asmara and started to build. In 1995, British architect Edward Dennison took a tour through Africa and happened upon a place he didn't know existed. It wasn't until I got to Eritrea that I actually felt that I'd really reached the place that I wanted to see in the whole continent of Africa, and this place was just extraordinary to me that such a rich heritage and um, background in my field uh, wasn't known about by the rest of the world, which seemed strange. But it was Eritrea's capital, Asmara, and its quirky modern design that particularly inspired the architectural side of Edward Dennison. What Dennison would uncover in Asmara was the amazing story of how the new Rome would rise. Asmara for me is, is almost like an urban utopia. As a built environment, it's, the scale is almost perfect. For me, it creates an environment which is incredibly safe, um, incre incredibly pleasurable to walk around. And uh, for, certainly for African countries, I think a lot of people who don't know Africa well perceive African cities to be quite hostile. But Asmara breaks all those trends. It's uh, phenomenally peaceful. To be able to walk around Asmara is one of the distinct pleasures. In the 1920s, the pleasure was all Mussolini's. While Italians enjoyed the climate in cafes, war planning went on inside these distinct buildings. This style of building happened on purpose. The new Roman Empire of the future would require the look of the future. Whether you call it Art Deco, modernist, or rationalist, it is, above all, utopian. All of this piqued Edward Dennison's interest. These sweeping buildings were rooted in the rise of fascism. But how? The original architectural drawings had long ago been stashed away in Eritrean archives, forgotten. So Dennison and his wife, Guan Yu Wen, did some detective work. So we spent the next four or five months, almost every day, uh, researching through these archives, around 20,000 files, researching every document um, from about 1936 to 1974. And there was a lot of art studio. Yeah, it's probably the best renovated building last night. What Dennison was uncovering were the secrets behind the construction of Mussolini's new Rome. And what he would discover would be incredible. Asmara was originally formed by merging four neighborhoods. And when the Italians came to colonize, they found the four villages a convenient way to achieve one of their first goals for Asmara, racial segregation. The colonials segregated Asmara into four zones, one for Italian, one mixed for Greeks, Arabs, and Jews, 
and one for indigenous Eritreans. The fourth was reserved for industry. But the Italians still had to eat. So the, the Italians inevitably had to conduct business with the Eritreans in order to buy food. And also the, the road to Masawa, the port where Italian supplies came through, was on the east of the city, near the Eritrean village. So between the Eritrean village and the Italian settlement, there emerged this market area where commerce was conducted. Exotic spices, aromatic foods, tropical fruits, valuables from far off lands. To get to the market, these goods had to come on a perilous journey. The road that connected Masawa on the Red Sea to that market was the lifeline of the country. All goods that came to the capital traveled this road. And for Italian tastes, too few goods were getting through this choke point. The reason is as true today as it was then. It was one of the most dangerous roads in the world. With hairpin turns, no guardrails, and straight down drops of hundreds of meters. So to make this 2,400 meter vertical climb to Asmara, the Italians needed a more reliable pipeline. Starting back in 1887, the Italians put their engineering skills to use with an incredibly ambitious project, a railway from Masawa at sea level, rising 2,500 meters nearly straight up to Asmara. The line reached the capital in 1911. And it's a fantastic uh, feat of architecture out there, you know, I mean, I mean the structure, the Italian genius for, uh, for, for engineering is phenomenal out there. The railroad was already in place when Mussolini came to power in 1923, but Il Duce would use it to bring in more than spices. It would now also ferry in the war supplies for his conquest of Africa. Today, it brings railroad aficionados from around the world. This train is special because um, it is exactly as it was uh, 100 years ago. The same uh, technology, the same... Uh, and it's still working. That means that it was um, a clever project. They, and they have done a good work. And like Asmara, the train would segregate people into three groups. It was divided in three classes. It was the, the first class, uh, uh, more expensive and for few people. Then it was the second class, and then the third class for the Eritreans. Very uncomfortable, but, but much, much better than walk from Masawa up to, up to Asmara. And its construction confronted both Eritreans and Italians with severe engineering challenges. The name of the bridge is Shigirini, which in Tigrinya language means uh, here we have a problem. Especially because it is uh, it's in a curve, curvature. So when the line uh, arrived here, they used to say every day Shigirini, Shigirini, how, how, it's a problem now, maybe the line stops here. Then an Italian specialist arrived here. They have uh, built up this bridge and uh, so they finally understood that, that it was possible to go on.
Also on was Mussolini's plan for a new Rome. And it was all very Italian. The climate made cafe life thrive. And cinemas. Italians were mad for cinema in the 1920s and 30s. So when Osmara was laid out, Mussolini made sure cinemas and theaters were in abundance. Asmara as a city is well adorned with cinemas. It was built during the, the golden age of film, and the Italians, of course, their love of film, uh, weren't afraid to build the, the structures to promote that. And um, there are about four or five very, very large cinemas, especially for a country the size of Eritrea in Asmara. A culture developed in Asmara, of a culture of going to the cinema as a family, you know. And this was at, at times when when movies were really movies also, you know. I mean, it, I, I, I remember long lines of people lining up to, to, to see films like, uh, I don't know, ben -Hur and uh, things like that, you know. I mean, there was a, a whole uh, atmosphere, a whole culture of, of the cinema that started with the Italians but continued. But the cinemas were to keep the Italians and the locals happy. What Mussolini was really building was a stage for himself. Well, he, they called it Little, Little Rome, Piccola Roma, which is Little Rome. Their architects of the 1930s were giving a free hand to do what it was that they wanted to do. And what Mussolini wanted, right down the middle of town, was a broad avenue named the Via Mussolini. The Italians also loved opera, so that avenue would be anchored by an opera house that would also remind locals who was in charge. The opera house, called the Asmara Theater, was built in 1920, and it remains unique in all the world. And it is seen here in high definition for the first time. It's, a wonder, it's the most beautiful building inside. Uh, the, the balconies are uh, so sort of circular or semicircular in form, overlooking the stage. But above the seated areas, this marvelous fresco painted by an Italian painter of um, peacocks and ladies dancing. But uh, generally, as a theater for, for a city like Asmara, it's the most wonderful theater. A little research revealed the motives behind the unusual layout of the theater. It had two entrances, a front entrance for Europeans who could sit on the floor level, and a side entrance for Eritreans to use. A winding staircase took Eritreans to the balconies, so Europeans would not have to encounter them. Sometimes they were not even allowed to watch uh, the same uh, film or the same show together. So there was uh, an apartheid system in Eritrea long before in South Africa. In addition to opera, the Asmara Theater staged movies, plays, and concerts. It would not be the only manifestation of how fascism would come to Asmara. Asmara was, in fact, being laid out purposefully to facilitate an even larger project. It would be from here that Mussolini would launch his invasion of Ethiopia, using Asmara as its jumping-off point. In the center of Asmara, on what was the Via Mussolini, is another modern building, but not just another. Today, it's the Ministry of Education. 
But in 1923, this building was christened the Casa del Fascio, literally the fascist house. And again, the blueprints reveal the politics behind the design. Mussolini had planned to come and visit Asmara. And if you've noticed, the Ministry of Education building is, has the shape of an axe, the fasc. You know, the fascist army's symbol was the, the axe. It would be a fitting symbol. A look at the original Italian blueprints offers more specific proof. A balcony from which Mussolini would address his public. And so he had planned to build a huge square, including the post office. And, uh, and, and address the people of Asmara. It would be Mussolini's stage for the opening shots of World War II. Architecture and war were coming together in Asmara. In October 1935, 400,000 Italian soldiers crossed from Eritrea and Italian Somaliland into Ethiopia. Awaiting them, were about half a million Ethiopians under Emperor Haile Selassie. It should have been an Italian rout. But the Ethiopian military surprised the world with its skill. Their Christmas counteroffensive shocked the Italians with its ferocity. But it only forestalled the inevitable. It took the Italians a year to conquer Ethiopia. They resorted to mustard gas to finish the job. The ousted emperor of Ethiopia, Haile Selassie, fled to London. Selassie warned the League of Nations, it is us today, tomorrow it is you. Three years later, Hitler invaded Poland. For four years, the region lived under brutal fascist rule. Il Duce was still in a hurry. In 1940, Italy invaded its British-held neighbors Somaliland and Sudan. But behind the lines, a stubborn insurgency kept the Italians off guard. In January 1941, the British launched a counteroffensive into Ethiopia and Eritrea. By May, Eritrea was in British hands, and Haile Selassie was returned to the throne in Ethiopia. But more than three quarters of a million Ethiopians and Eritreans had died at their hands. In 1943, Mussolini was overthrown, and in 1945, he was executed in Italy by communist partisans. His body and that of his mistress hung from meat hooks in public. Mussolini never visited Asmara. But ironically, his vision for the city had largely already taken shape and has remained that way ever since. During Edward Denison's journey through Asmara's architecture, one question nagged at him. These buildings, though beautiful, are cruel reminders of colonialism segregation and violence. Many nations in Africa, once shorn of colonialism, tend to destroy its reminders. But Eritreans did not. Why? That is in the past and uh, it should be preserved not only as, um, as a heritage and as a legacy of what has taken place, but also as a resource. And in a country like Eritrea, which is a very poor country, the buildings are a resource, if nothing else, but also for the story that it tells about the, uh, the ancestors of those that live there now. And the Eritreans are very proud about that. Their fathers and grandfathers and grandmothers had put the labor into creating those buildings. It might have been designed during a fascist period, but um, it was the Eritreans that, and their blood and sweat and tears that actually constructed those buildings. After World War II, the British administered Eritrea alongside Ethiopia. When the war ended, it was decided that the former Italian colonies, including Eritrea, were to build the responsibility of the four great powers, and the British were to become a caretaker government. After the war, Haile Selassie was viewed as a hero by many in the West for his resistance to the Axis. 
but Selassie also had ideas about Eritrea and friends at the newly created United Nations. He struck a deal, one that would sow the seeds for generations of conflict. In 1952, the UN voted for a federation between Ethiopia and Eritrea. It seemed fair at the time, but Eritrea soon realized that the fine print worked against them. Eritrea became a, uh, an autonomous unit federated to Ethiopia under the sovereignty of the Ethiopian crown. So there was no federal government set. The Ethiopian government became the federal government. It was called the federation. Then Eritrea started to realize that they were duped. If the Eritreans felt gypped in the Federation, it would get worse. In 1961, Haile Selassie dissolved the Federation. The next year, he annexed Eritrea. This would touch off a 30-year resistance movement that would one day be called the best guerrilla army in the world. These 100-foot-long depots will be completed and buried within 10 days. Hidden in the hills, camouflaged in the valleys throughout Eritrea, is a complex maze of underground workshops, supply dumps, garages, hospitals, schools, and other support. This rare footage from the 1970s shows the subterranean life of Eritrea's independence movement the Eritrean People's Liberation Front. Since 1961, the guerrillas had been resisting Haile Selassie's rule, and by the 1970s, was squirreled away in the mountains, living underground and slowly recapturing territory. But in addition to fighting the Ethiopian army, the EPLF created its own subterranean government. It was a practice government, yes. It wanted, you know, what do you replace it? With. I mean, whatever it is that you, you're opposing, what do you replace it with? And from 1976, 77, 78, the Liberation Front had almost liberated the whole of Eritrea except for four or five towns. Local knowledge of the rugged terrain made it easier for the Eritreans to gain and hold territory and to put the territory they held to use. The very first thing the fighters started was a school. During our army struggle, we started our schooling in 1976. We call it Zero School. Zero School or Revolution School. I happened to, to be one of the founders of that school, the, the, the Revolution School. We used to call it the Zero School. It was the code name for it. This Revolution School has contained or accommodated children of the fighters, of displaced people, of the people who live around that uh, area, liberated area. This school acted as prototype where we developed our curriculum without any help. Little by little, the fighters created a functioning society literally underground, complete with hospitals, factories, and road and vehicle networks. Little industries cropped up everywhere. All sorts of things, you know. We, we didn't have shoes, so we started to produce shoes in the field. Pharmacy, a pharmaceutical uh, factory uh, was, was established out there. And the semblance of a government, you know, with, complete with its uh, financial section, administrative section, and so on, uh, developed out there. Running an underground government means multitasking. Schools and health programs were run in tandem. While an underground section nearby fits new stocks to captured or damaged weapons. Machine shops rebuilt captured Ethiopian weaponry. Or melted them down to make ammunition of their own. Although they it happened mostly underground and mostly at night. The fighters had no international allies and faced in Ethiopia a country 20 times its size. Yet somehow, the Eritreans were winning. By 1977, the fighters could, if they dared a daylight foray, see the city of Asmara, held by a 10,000-man Ethiopian garrison. They had come to the gates of their capital. 
But then, stalemate. The Ethiopians mounted an offensive and the fighters withdrew. It would take another 16 years for the fighters to achieve independence. The Soviet Union supported Ethiopia. The U.S. was aloof. The Eritreans, given little chance of success, received no international aid for their fight. Yet their resourcefulness allowed the Eritreans to keep their underground government running almost indefinitely, while Ethiopia's problems, like famine and the fall of their allies in the Soviet Union, piled up. Through it all, the fighters kept chipping away. The BBC called them the best guerrilla army in the world. It's, it's, a, it's a whole uh, accumulation of all the kinds of things that were done. I mean, the little uh, battles, the little guerrilla and other kinds of tactics that cut the fingers of, uh, of, 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 the, uh, of the Ethiopian government. Eventually, the grip of the Ethiopians slipped. The Eritreans retook its cities one by one. And by 1991, they finally took Asmara. A small group of fighters had fought off a nation 20 times its size and seized its independence. Everything that went into winning that war, everything, all the philosophy, all this education that we're talking about, all the little uh, factories and, and things, all the effort, the whole effort, the, and the support that the, the, the whole of the population was giving uh, the, uh, the EPLF made me realize that at last we've got it. In 1993, there was a United Nations brokered referendum on independence for Eritrea. The vote was 99% yes. Eritrea became a sovereign nation and a member of the UN. Now, Eritrea's practice government from underground was put into place. The Eritreans were now running their own country. It is Easter time in Asmara, and school children awaiting their first communion process down Liberation Avenue in Asmara. Within half a mile of this spot are several Catholic, Orthodox, and Protestant churches, several mosques, and a synagogue. How could a small land of nine different ethnic groups and languages, half Christian and half Muslim, hang together for 30 years of war, then live together without internal turmoil. Father Abraha Bokru is pastor of the Cathedral of St. Mary in Asmara, and to him, the reason does not go back 30 years or 100 years. It goes back to biblical times. You can you see that, for example, a good, smooth understanding between Christians and uh, Muslims, and uh, with the Christians themselves also, a good understanding and living together, you can notice here. And it's because I think of the a lot of Jewish culture elements before the first century which uh, were well inculturated into the family, society, mind, spirit. The people of Eritrea and Ethiopia are Semitic, part of the ancient family of languages that descended from the time of Christ. Languages such as Aramaic, Canaanite, Akkadian, and also some of the languages still widely spoken today in Ethiopia and Eritrea, Tigrinya, Tigray, Arabic. Then, these parts of Eritrea and Ethiopia were called Aksum, and was claimed to be the home of the Ark of the Covenant, and ruled by the Queen of Sheba. In the fourth century AD, Aksum became the first major empire to convert to Christianity. Others followed. 
But when Islam came to the region in the 7th century, it didn't fully replace Christianity. Instead, the two major religions grew side by side in this land. That history of coexistence is in the blood of the Eritrean people and has held up under stress. In fact, in major Muslim areas, Christians were being protected by, their, by, by their, their neighbors and the same thing was happening in the Christian areas. Muslims were being protected. I mean, people didn't follow the lead of their political parties and kill each other. They didn't do that. They stayed away. And this tendency to move back and maintain all the relationships has been characteristic of, of the Eritrean uh, society to this date. In the highland where they have Orthodox Christians, Catholics and Rosan, they have a good normal, uh, they invite each other, they take part also in any uh, social work or activity or uh, family. For example, when there is wedding, when there is a funeral, somebody dies, everybody takes part. So his religion remains intact, but he becomes part of the religious and social life. Therefore, they are invited in our feasts. We, we are also invited to take part in their feasts. The religion remains within the compound or the church or the, the mosque. There is no question about it. There is an air of serenity to Eritreans. That serenity is reflected in its capital, Asmara. To have reached Asmara, I think, meant something very, very special. And that's deep, deep in, down in the Eritrean psyche. So I think physically and metaphorically, Asmara means a tremendous amount to Eritrea and Eritreans. That serenity would be put to the test immediately upon independence. Eritrea premiered as the third poorest nation in the world. It discovered that many of its children were malnourished. Its infant mortality rate was 88 per thousand. Its under five mortality rate was 147 per thousand. And not enough children were attending school. It was Eritrea's first national emergency. You can't build the hospital in one year. You can't produce doctors in six months. You can't produce nurses in one year. But what Eritrea already had were schools and teachers, hundreds of schools and thousands of teachers, many of them in the very same remote spots the fighters were underground. Most of our sort of struggle, of course, was in the countryside. So it was in the most difficult and remote areas. So we were able to work with the most unable part of Eritrea. Which set up an intriguing possibility. If education and health could go together in the trenches, maybe they could also in peacetime. This is Karen, one of the biggest cities in northern Eritrea. And it is here that part of a huge national experiment is taking place. One teacher from each school in the area has been sent to this classroom for urgent training, how to spot small health problems before they become large. Problems like ear infections, skin infections, stunted growth, rotten teeth, and poor eyesight. If teachers can spot these problems early, disaster can be avoided later. It's not just being done in Karen. This training has happened in every region of the country and every school is represented. This mountaintop village is called Hadish Adi in northern Eritrea, near where much of the War of Independence was fought. This village, just up in the hills, is one of the remote places that we have. It takes nearly four between four and five hours to drive through the village. That's if you have a car, which these villagers don't. But now, teachers here check eyes and ears, monitor growth or lack thereof, 
they are able to refer children to the nearest health outpost for basic treatment. Before problems get so large as to require a long trip to the city. And though it began in remote areas, the idea was for school health to work everywhere. Every school in Eritrea receives basic health services. From the northern hills to the city, to the deserts of the Red Sea. But how to reach nomadic people? In the northern Red Sea region of Eritrea, in some of the hottest desert in the world, live a group of reclusive, proud people called Raishida. The Raishada are nomadic and have retained a measure of autonomy in Eritrea. You can spot a Raishida woman by her colorful veil. There are only about 150,000 Rashida in the world, and yet they must also be reached by the public health system. This particular group of Rashida are just one of several families of nomadic people living near the village of Wakiro. When you come to our area, most of the parents they are nomads. They don't have settled in life. They move from one place to another place. During June, July, even uh, September, it's very hot in this area. Therefore, they migrate to the place where they can find water. But here, too, the teachers have been trained. And they know that anemia is a big problem in this area because the nomads subsist on a low iron diet. The treatment, a weekly iron tablet to every student each week of the school year that they are in this part of the country. Every child must take 32 tablets in a year because we have 32 academic weeks and every week a child takes one tablet. Thanks to the iron pill distribution, anemia has dropped from 14% to 4% among children in the Northern Red Sea region. Small problems with small solutions prevent bigger problems down the road. The results are real and measurable. Samples show malnutrition among the youngest children down 27%. Death of children under five of malnutrition or upper respiratory infection cut in half. Children who attend kindergarten 30% more likely still to be in school by second grade. Eritrea embraced its historical unity to tackle child health. That unity would have to be summoned again to rebuild something else the war had ruined. During Ethiopian occupation, the railway had fallen into disrepair. In 1975, the Ethiopian regime dismantled the railroad. Both sides forage war materials from its parts. After the war, the new country was determined to repair its railroad. Their sanity was questioned. After 30 years of destruction, it has a very high value. While everybody told them that it was not possible, absolutely impossible to use this material, and they were crazy if they would have tried. But they didn't just try, they succeeded. The Asmara station was salvaged. Slowly, the line was restored, starting at Masawa. By 2003, the line had once again reached Asmara. Eleven steam locomotives survived, and six have been returned to working order. Two 1957 vintage Littorina rail cars are also running again. The original 1930s passenger cars were restored as well.
Its capabilities are limited, but the Eritreans returned their railroad to working order without any international assistance or loans. The same can't be said of Asmara's architecture. Having uncovered the blueprints of Asmara's past, Edward Dennison embarked upon a mission to preserve these buildings from decay and destruction in a newly independent Eritrea. The initial intention for my wife and I was to write a book because we felt that was the best platform in which to promote this heritage to an international audience. And we proposed that idea to the Heritage Project, having already done that work in the archives. The result was Asmara, Africa's secret modernist city. It remains the only widely published book about Eritrea's architecture, and it spawned a movement within Eritrea to begin reconstruction work on some of its most treasured buildings. The project, called CARP, brought out architects like Berhane Mahare and Naizi Gebermadin to go over the old blueprints and triage a few of the most culturally valuable structures most in need of repair. For me, it was possibly the, the perfect job. It was, it was wonderful to know that the work you were doing was able to complement a project that was taking place in Africa, which, in the right circumstances, will help develop, in my opinion, will help towards the development of a nation. The first building on the list, the Asmara Theatre. The Eritreans commissioned blueprints on how to shore up and restore the magnificent 80-year-old theater. But events would eventually catch up with Eritrea's rise. The border with Ethiopia has been a constant source of tension, and in 1998, it burst into full-scale war, and tens of thousands were killed on both sides. Since then, Eritrea has been stuck in a stalemate. All men, and some women, 18 to 40 years old, serve in the military, many of them on the border. The economy wobbles, and tension mounts. They call it, no peace, no war. Many of Eritrea's gains hang in the balance, including the now postponed renovation of the Asmara Theater and the rest of Asmara's modern architecture as well. Now it sits, mostly idle, awaiting its fate. Nothing is being torn down, but if years of neglect ensue, time will ultimately tear down these treasures. The bright spot? Eritrea's school health initiatives, precisely because they are designed to be cost-effective and create a multiplier effect from its teacher workforce, is still in effect. In the meantime, Eritrea's greatest achievement is still its existence as a nation, still without heavyweight international allies, still eyeball to eyeball with a neighboring country many times its size, still poised for yet another conflict. If it comes, will this nation, which has beaten the odds so many times, pull it off again 